Amen. You can take a seat. Well, good morning. Hey, my name is Nick, and uh, I've been here at Fellowship for 20 years, grew up here at FSM, and now get the joy of serving on the teaching team at our Saturday night congregation, Fellowship Mosaic. And it is it's a joy for me to be back with you this morning as we, uh, we kick off a new series and a new year together. So good morning. I'm glad to be here. Hey, have you ever been a foreigner in a foreign land? Have you ever been somewhere where all the rhythms and the ways of doing life you're used to seem completely different. For some of you, that might be the U.S. Uh, You might be new to this country, and this might be your foreign land. And I just want to say we're glad you're here. Welcome. Some of you, walking into a church might feel like entering a foreign land. And the language and the behavior and the activity, I mean, there aren't a lot of places in life where you wake up, you get ready, and you go sing with people for 15 minutes. Um, unless you're in a professional choir. So this can feel like a very foreign kind of place to you. And if that's the case, we're also glad that you're here. And and we hope to get to know you and make this place a little less foreign to you. I had the experience of being a foreigner in a foreign land when I was in college. Uh, my, My now wife and I were engaged to be married. It was the summer between our junior and senior year. And we sang in a choir for the University of Arkansas that did a tour of Central Europe. And so we did this tour together. And then after the tour was over... We were both going to different study abroad programs in Italy before we would then come back to the States and get married at the end of the summer. It was a really big summer. And uh, my MO in life tends to be to have a lot of confidence and very low prep. And that's just how I tend to tackle things. And so to get to my study abroad program in Florence, Italy, we finished our choir tour in Vienna. And I was supposed to be at an orientation at the school the next afternoon at like four or something like that. And I had a plane ticket from Vienna to Rome and then a lot of confidence. And this was before smartphones. This was before international plans on cell phones. So there's no like reaching out for any help that way. And so I, I, Cassie and I, we're going to different parts of, of central Italy. We get on this plane from Vienna to Rome and I get out of the plane in Rome and I discover that they don't speak English in Italy. Did you know that? Um, And so I start going around asking for help, and I'm getting nowhere. I then discover Florence isn't even a city that exists in Italy. They call it by a different name, Firenze. So I'm looking on these boards for Florence, and it's not there. So I go to where you, you get a train ticket at the airport, and after a whole lot of pointing and gesturing and confusion, I, I figure out how to get us train tickets from Rome to Florence, and then I walk to the platforms and have no idea how to read any of the timetables or any of the maps. And so I I go to what I think is the platform for the train that we're supposed to get on, and it's like two minutes until the train is supposed to leave, and there's no train at my platform. And I look at the thing, I look at all the stuff around, and I realize the train that I'm supposed to leave on that, that leaves in two minutes is like 10 platforms down. And we have two suitcases each and a backpack. And so we take off sprinting down this train platform, get to our train, throw our bags on the first car and get on and are just like heaving as the train takes off. And we realize that we just jumped on the first class car and our seats are 12 cars back. So then we're those obnoxious people walking down that narrow aisle, hitting everyone with our suitcases. All the people that paid good money to be in first class and not have to get hit by the American college students that don't know what they're doing. This is what it is to be a foreigner. All of the resources that you normally have for for living life the way you're used to living, for really simple tasks, are taken away from you. And, And you're disoriented. You're incredibly vulnerable and dependent on someone else to see you and go, can I help you out here? And to step in. And that experience of being a foreigner is a regular part of Israel's story in the scriptures, of being in a land that's not their own. But then there's another layer to it. Beyond just being a foreigner, there's there's another experience of when you are a foreigner because you have been forced out of your home. When there's a place that you have a sense of belonging, that you call home, that you long to be, but you have been forced to leave and you are not allowed to return. You've been displaced. And there's a word we have for that when you're forced from your homeland and not allowed to return. It's called exile. And this experience of exile that the people of Israel went through was one of the most formative and shaping experiences of the nation of Israel. 
And in fact, it's so powerful that later on in the New Testament, the theme of exile is gonna be picked up to describe life for believers in Christ. We'll get to that in a moment. But what set up the exile was an experience of conflict. When Israel was conquered by the people of Babylon, when their city Jerusalem was destroyed, when their temple where they worshiped God was burned to the ground, and when two nations went to war against each other in these times, it wasn't just two nations. They thought of it as two gods going to war against each other. It wasn't just the conflict of Israel and Babylon. They saw it as a conflict between Yahweh and Marduk. Now, if that sounds foreign to you, that's not that different from the way we think of things today. During the Cold War, did we just see it as a conflict between the United States and the Soviet Union? No, we saw it as a conflict between ideologies, between capitalism and communism, and which one was going to win. These two nations having conflict was seen as a, something more significant about what was true and what was helpful and what was best for people. And that's the same way they thought of it then, that when two nations had a conflict, their gods were going to war with each other. Therefore, when Babylon crushed Israel, everyone would have interpreted that as Yahweh was just defeated. The God of Israel lost and is no longer able to protect his people. That would have been the question, the idea in the minds of Israel. And that gave birth to a new group of prophets during the exile to whom God revealed what was happening, that he did not in fact lose, but there was a reason for what took place. So to set up the book of Esther that we're starting today, we need to get just a little bit more context as to what's going on to make sense of the significance of this moment for Israel and for us today. So we're going to do a mini tour of the Old Testament. Uh, many of us, whether you've grown up in church or not, our exposure to the Bible comes in little bitty chunks, verses here and there. And it's often hard to gain a, a big picture perspective on the story of Scripture. We actually have a class here at Fellowship called Panorama of the Bible that does that, that goes Genesis to Revelation, the whole story. I really encourage you um, to take that class as soon as you get the opportunity. You'll be hearing about it soon, I'm sure. Um, but what we're going to do this morning is we're going to cover a very brief survey of the Old Testament through four big events. Four big events that are, that are a pared-down version of Panorama. And if you want to know the story of the, the people of Israel, you basically need to know Abraham, Exodus, David, and Exile. These are the landmark things that shaped the people of Israel. And you can see there the, the correlating uh, movements in, in panorama that we talk about. You see, Israel started after the entire world had been broken by sin and had fallen apart. And God moved to intervene and heal the world. And he did it by choosing a man named Abraham and his wife, Sarah. And he promised to bless them. He said, I'm gonna take you to a land. And I'm gonna place you in that land. I'm gonna give that land to you. I'm gonna give you a family that's gonna grow into a nation. I'm gonna protect you. And through you and your family, I'm gonna heal the entire world. Think about the audacity of that promise. To one couple, I'm going to fix what's broken in the world through you and your family. And so he takes Abraham and Sarah there and, and he begins to work through them and he makes this promise in, in Genesis 12 and 15 and 17. You can see one portion of it on the screen now. And one of the patterns we see play out in this story over and over again is that when God makes a promise, God keeps that promise. It's just a few generations later that the descendants of Abraham find themselves in trouble. They're now living as, living as foreigners in Egypt, and while there, they are enslaved by Pharaoh. So now the entire people are living as slaves in Egypt. And they cry out, God, do you remember your promise? God, you said you were gonna bless us. Are you gonna take care of us? And guess what? When God makes a promise, God keeps that promise. And so that leads to the story of the Exodus where God rescues his people out of slavery, defeats Pharaoh, and brings them back into the land of promise. And on the way, he, he stops and meets with them at the mountain of Mount Sinai. And he speaks through Moses and he tells them, this is how I want you to live with me. This is what it's gonna look like for you to know me and walk with me while you're in the land. And he says, if you'll be faithful to me, if you will be loyal to me as your only God and love your neighbor well, 
everything's going to go great with you in the land. You'll be blessed. You won't have to fear foreign invaders. You won't have to fear suffering. But there's another side of that coin. In Deuteronomy, when Moses is laying this out to the people, he says, however, if you do not obey the Lord your God and do not carefully follow all his commands and decrees I'm giving you today, all these curses will come on you and overtake you. The Lord will drive you and the king you set over you to a nation unknown to you or your ancestors. There you will worship other gods, gods of wood and stone. God made a promise. If you're faithful, I'll take care of you. If you abandon me, you won't be able to stay in the land. And what does God do when he makes a promise? He keeps his promise. Years later, because God said he was gonna give them a king, they got a king named David who was a man after God's own heart, who had a desire to know God and to lead the people in knowing God. And for a moment, it looks like the, like the glory of the kingdom of God is coming to earth in this man, David. And God makes another promise to David. He tells David, I'm gonna have a descendant of yours on the throne of Israel forever. David's line will rule Israel and one day rule the nations. Everything looks like it's coming together and you know how long it lasts? One generation, David's son Solomon becomes a pioneer for abandoning Yahweh in Israel, for abandoning the God of Israel. He goes after other gods. He commits about every disobedience he can. And as a result of Solomon's sin and the sin that comes, the whole nation begins falling to pieces. The book of 2 Kings is a depressing read. It is just one failure after another. And after Israel, over generations, continues to rebel against God, to kill their neighbor, to oppress the poor, to chase after other gods. God remembered his promise. If you're faithful, you'll stay in the land and be safe. If you persist in disobedience, I will drive you out of the land. Because when God makes a promise, he keeps his promise. So that led to the exile. When, Bab when God allowed Babylon to come in and crush Jerusalem and take the people away. And it was important for Israel to understand what happened in the exile was not that Yahweh failed to protect them. It was that Yahweh actually kept his promise to discipline them if they sinned. And so Israel comes under first the Babylonian Empire where they're hauled off, and then the Persians capture the Babylonians, and when the Persians conquer the Babylonians, they kind of inherit uh, Israel by default. But under the Persians, a king is raised up named Cyrus who says, you know what, Israel, you can go home. Exactly. Actually, God made a promise through Jeremiah that the exile would last 70 years. And in God's sovereign control, after 70 years, Cyrus said, you can go home. Return to your land. Rebuild Jerusalem. Rebuild the temple. And, and that's recorded for us in the book of Ezra. And it's in the context of this history and this story, this experience of exile, that we get these prophets and, and writers that tell us about life in exile. You see, all of the commands of the Old Testament they describe how Israel can structure a society that honors the Lord when Israel's in leadership, when they have control. But it's an entirely different situation to be a people in exile. They don't have control of the government. They don't get to structure society the way they want. Instead, they have to figure out how are we to be faithful to the Lord when we live in a place that doesn't honor the Lord. And that's why this picture of exile became an important theme for the New Testament church, because that was the experience of the first church. They lived in, a, in an empire called Rome that had no interest in honoring the Lord. At first, they hadn't even heard of Jesus, and, they, and Caesar could not care less about what it looked like to honor the Lord. So the early church wasn't interested in how do we change the government and the culture to fit our ethic, but rather, how do we be faithful to the Lord when the government and the culture couldn't care less. They had no expectation or promise that they would win the culture wars. Their expectation and promise is that they would be faithful to the Lord, regardless of what the culture does. And the message for a people in exile is when it seems like you are losing cultural influence on every front, that in no way affects your ability to be faithful to the Lord. And so we're going to look at the books of Daniel and Esther to, to gain perspective on what God's up to for a people living in exile, living in a home that is not their own. It's not the ultimate place they will be. 
while they continue to be faithful to the Lord in that place. Now, Daniel and Esther take pretty opposite approaches to doing this. In the book of Daniel, the people are in exile in Babylon, and Daniel is interested in pulling back the curtain on what God's doing. When everything seems crazy, Daniel, Daniel goes, hey, God is in control, and let me show you his plan. Let me show you how he's sovereign over the nations. And it, it really lays out what God is doing in history. And you get to see some really faithful Jewish people being loyal to Yahweh in a difficult situation. Esther is almost the complete opposite. Esther is like the anti-Daniel. Instead of pulling back the curtain and showing what God's doing, God's name is never mentioned once in the book of Esther. And the book of Esther almost lets us see life from the way it might have seemed to a Jewish person who didn't have the divine perspective of what's going on. And another interesting thing about the book of Esther is at the time of Esther, it happens after Cyrus sent the people home. So we have a large number of faithful Jewish people who returned to Jerusalem to rebuild the temple, to worship Yahweh. So we should ask the question, who are these Jews that chose not to go back to Jerusalem? Who chose to stay in Persia? This is all of the the background that's going on as we come to the book of Esther. And it should raise the question, what is God up to when he seems totally absent? When his name is not named, when his people are not praying? And will God keep his promise to be faithful even to a people who are not faithful? That's the question we're going to be wrestling with as we look to the book of Esther. Now, this morning, to set things up, uh, we're going to take a look at a big chunk, chapters 1 to 3, and we only have 15 minutes to do it. What do you think our chances are? We need a little help, so we're going to get some help from our friends at the Bible Project. Take a look. The book of Esther, it's one of the more exciting and curious books in the Bible. The story is set over 100 years after the Babylonian exile of the Israelites from their land. And while some Jews did return to Jerusalem, remember Ezra and Nehemiah, many did not. And so the book of Esther is about a Jewish community living in Susa, the capital city of the ancient Persian Empire. The main characters in this story are two Jews, Mordecai and then his niece Esther. And then there's the king of Persia, who's something of a drunken pushover in this story. And then there's the Persian official Haman, the cunning villain. Now this is a curious book in the Bible, mainly for the fact that God is never even mentioned, not once. Which might strike you as kind of odd. I mean, isn't the Bible about God? But this is a brilliant technique by the author, who's anonymous, by the way. It's an invitation to read this story looking for God's activity, and there are signs of it everywhere. The story is full of very odd, quote, coincidences and ironic reversals, and it all forces you to see God's purpose at work, but behind the scenes. Let's just dive into the story. The book opens with the king of Persia throwing two elaborate banquets feasts that last a total of 187 days, and it's all for the grandiose purpose of displaying his greatness and splendor. On the last day of the banquet feast, he's really drunk, and he demands that his wife, Queen Vashti, appear at the party to show off her beauty. She refuses, and so in a drunken rage, the king deposes Vashti and makes the silly decree that all Persian men should now be the masters of their own homes. Then he holds a beauty pageant because he wants to find a new queen. This is like a really bad soap opera. But it's right here that we're introduced to Esther and Mordecai. Esther hides her Jewish identity and enters the beauty pageant and wins. And the king is so obsessed with Esther that he elevates her to become the new queen of Persia. Now after this, and even more serendipitous, is the fact that Mordecai just happens to overhear two royal guards plotting to murder the king. And so he informs Esther, who in turn informs the king, and Mordecai gets credit for saving the king's life. Now right here from the beginning, God's not mentioned anywhere, but this all seems providentially ordered. What is it that God's up to? You have to keep reading. We're next introduced to Haman, who's not actually a Persian. He's called an Agagite. He's a descendant of the ancient Canaanites. Remember 1 Samuel chapter 15. The king elevates Haman to the highest position in the kingdom, and he demands that everybody kneel before Haman. Well, when Mordecai sees Haman, he refuses to kneel, which of course fills Haman with rage. And when he finds out that Mordecai's Jewish, 
Haman successfully persuades the king to enact this crazy decree to destroy all of the Jewish people. And to decide the date of the Jews' annihilation, Haman rolls the dice. A die is called pur in Hebrew. Tuck that away for later. Eleven months later, on the 13th of Adar, all the Jews will die. Haman and the king then have a drinking banquet to celebrate their really horrible decision. All right, let's pray and go home. <laughs> Everybody crystal clear on the spiritual implications for your life right now? Hey, as we read this story, um, we're going to walk through a, a Three scenes, three scenes that are going to focus on two characters each. And there's going to be a temptation to read it a certain way. Many of us have, have in some way or another, learned to read the Bible very similarly to the way we would read fairy tales or nursery rhymes. And the way that happens is you figure out who the good guy is and who the bad guy is. And the good guy does good things, and so good things happen. And we want to be like the good guy. The bad guy does bad things, and bad things happen. Don't be like the bad guy. If you try to read the book of Esther that way, you're going to get tangled up in knots because the characters in the story are kind of a mess and something much more significant is going on here. Oftentimes, the Bible doesn't present us with purely good people and purely bad people. Actually, what the story says is we're all broken and we all make good choices and bad choices and the really interesting question is what does God do with these people who are broken. And the story of Esther is less about trying to imitate the characters in the story than it is looking for what is God up to in these characters' lives. So when we turn to the first scene, when we take a look at Xerxes and his queen Vashti, what we find is we find Xerxes, the, the ruler of the Persian Empire, and he throws this giant epic party in chapter 1. Um, it says that he gathers, in verse 3, it says, In the third year of his reign, he gave a banquet for all his nobles and officials, the military leaders of Persia and Medea. The princes and the nobles of the provinces were present. Now, we know from history what's probably happening here when he gathered all of his leaders in the third year. This is probably a banquet and a meeting to gain support to go to war with Greece. That was Xerxes' obsession. He wanted to go defeat the Greeks. So the way he would do that is he would gather, he needed the support of the wealthy leaders in the, in the empire. So he would gather them together at his palace and he would throw a huge party and show off his wealth. And what he would say is this, if you go to war and we conquer Greece, we're gonna gain even more wealth. And to the people who give the most to the war effort, you will get the most of the rewards. So just look around at my wealth and think this could be yours too. So that's probably what's going on at this meeting is he's trying to convince people to support the war. But one of the things that we have to recognize as we read Esther, we tend to come to the Bible assuming everything is very solemn and serious. Esther is a comedy. Esther is meant to be ironic and funny. It, Purim, the, the festival that Israel celebrates today for Esther, which we'll talk more about later in the series, it, it's like American Halloween. Kids dress up in costumes and get candy, and people throw big parties, and they tell this story laughing and cheering. And when we read about what's going on with Xerxes, we're supposed to laugh. The man, the, the ruler of the Persian Empire, who's preparing for this epic war, literally throws a six-month drunken party. And that's how they prepare to go attack Greece. Well, we should read this like one of the comedy news shows that, that pokes fun at politics and, and the anchor comes on and says, well, Congress has gathered today to debate the latest budget. Let's see how it's going. And it flips to a shot of people standing on tables drinking and partying. And they come back to the anchor. He says, that's your tax dollars hard at work. That's the feel of Esther chapter one is they're going, hey, let's look at how Persians make decisions. And then they show the Persian court and it's a disaster. And so we're supposed to, to mock and laugh at what's going on in this court. And then Xerxes, in his showing off, everybody's partying and drinking and having a great time to show off a little bit more how great his life is. He goes, hey, have y'all seen my wife? Hey, hey, Vashti, come here and let all the men look at you. And she says, no, I'm not going to do that. And he suddenly is humiliated in front of his party guests. And so what does he do as a wise leader? Well, he just divorces his wife says, you're not my queen anymore. Now, this is one of the first places where our interpretation has gone badly wrong if we read this 
looking for behavior morals on how to live. Because there's a long line of interpretation that has taken Esther chapter 1 and said the point is, and women, that's why you obey your husbands. There's a lot of things I would love to say about that interpretation of Esther chapter 1. But let me just begin to tell you why that's not what it's about. What they want to do is they, people who interpret that want to say Vashti is the example of a bad wife. And Esther comes in as the good submissive wife. The problem with that interpretation is nothing in Xerxes' marriage is showing us what healthy marriage is supposed to look like. This is a man who names one of the 300 women in his harem his queen. We are not being presented this story of Esther to teach us about marriage practice. Trust me, the Persian court is not the place you want to look to find how to have a healthy marriage. There are plenty of passages in the scripture where that's the focus. Esther's not it. The point of Esther is not to compare Vashti and Esther as wives. Now, in recent years, people have swung the pendulum the other way, and they've said, oh, here's how we should read Esther chapter 1. Xerxes is an example of patriarchy, and Vashti refuses to yield to masculine dominance and toxic masculinity. And in this reading, Vashti is the hero, and Esther's actually the villain who gives in and is passive in front of patriarchy. Now, there is no way in the reading of the book of Esther in its historical context that you can come up with a reading where Vashti's the hero and Esther's the villain. But both of these interpretations go wrong by assuming that what we should be doing is analyzing the characters to figure out which one is our role model. That's not what it's about. Instead, what chapter one is about is it's showing us how messed up and out of control this world is. It's showing us that things are upside down and this man should not have the power he does because he clearly is an out of control person. And it's setting the stage to understand what a dangerous situation Esther's walking into. And so then we come to chapter two where we read that later when King Xerxes' fury had subsided, he remembered Vashti and what she had done and what he had decreed about her. Then the king's personal attendants proposed, let a search be made for beautiful young virgins for the king. And then we read in verse five, now there was in the citadel of Susa, a Jew of the tribe of Benjamin named Mordecai, son of Jair, the son of Shimei, the son of Kish, who had been carried into exile from Jerusalem by Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon. Among those taken captive with Jehoiachin, king of Judah, Mordecai had a cousin named Hadassah, whom he had brought up because she had neither father nor mother. This young woman, who was also known as Esther, had a lovely figure and was beautiful. Mordecai had taken her as his own daughter when her father and mother had died. And then later on, we read that Esther, this young Jewish girl, enters into this competition to become the new queen. Now again, if we're reading chapter two looking for heroes, we're gonna end up with a very confusing reading. First of all, if we wanna look at Mordecai and Esther as the example of faithfulness here, there is nothing in their story that suggests that they are faithful worshipers of Yahweh being loyal to him. In fact, their very names, Mordecai and Esther, are the names of Persian gods. He is named, Mordecai is named for Marduk. That God that's supposed to be opposed to Yahweh and Esther is after Ishtar. That doesn't necessarily mean that they run faithful to Yahweh, but they're not being portrayed as these faithful people. Furthermore, if you're reading this story in the original context, um, that video very tastefully described it as a beauty contest. Um, this is the way the beauty contest worked. Young women were brought into the harem and then were sent to spend one night in bed with the king. And the one that he enjoyed the most, he would name his queen. If you're reading this story, your response is not to be looking to find out, like, what did Esther do right here, but to go, what in the world is a young Jewish girl doing enter, entering into Persian bachelor? Like, something is wrong here with this story. Now, we shouldn't necessarily judge Esther. She may have had no choice in the matter. The, the Persian king may have just snatched up every young woman, and, and she might not, but that's not the point. The point is not to assess Esther's behavior. At this point, we're supposed to just be puzzled by how upside down the world is. That when God's people are rebuilding Jerusalem, back in this crazy world of Persia, a young Jewish girl is brought into Xerxes' harem 
and made queen. And then further, we read the story of Mordecai in verse 21 of chapter 2. During that time, Mordecai, during the time Mordecai was sitting at the king's gate. The gate would have been just outside the palace. It would have been the administrative area, very similar to how our White House is structured, that you have the residential portion and then the administrative portion where they get work done. Uh, the Persian king's palace would have had the place where he lived, and then the gate would have been the place where administrative things were done, and people came to make petitions. So Mordecai works in the administration of, of Xerxes' palace. He was sitting at the king's gate. Bithana and Teresh, two of the king's officers who guarded the doorway, became angry and conspired to assassinate King Xerxes. But Mordecai found out about the plot and told Queen Esther, who in turn reported it to the king, giving credit to Mordecai. And when the report was investigated and found to be true, the two officials were impaled on poles. That's lovely. All this was recorded in the book of the annals in the presence of the king. So we get this little story about Mordecai hearing a plot and saving the king. Now, everyone who's listening to this story knows what should come next in the original context. Mordecai just saved the king. He should be honored. He should be celebrated. He should be given a position of power. And the story moves on with no comment. Mordecai is completely ignored for the service he's done to the king. And then we come to chapter 3, the story of Mordecai and Haman. And in this story, Haman is, instead of immediately after Mordecai's moment, where you're expecting chapter 3 should be, so Mordecai was honored and lifted up. Instead, we read, Haman is honored and lifted up. And an original reader would be going, hey, that's not fair. You'd be crying out at injustice. And then it gets even worse. When Haman is lifted up and honored and Mordecai refuses to bow to him, Haman makes a plot that the king buys into to murder every Jew in the empire. Uh, there is a, a demonic pattern throughout history for this anti-Semitic hatred of the Jewish people that we've seen play out so many times in history even up to this day. And we see the pattern here in the book of Esther of an irrational hatred that started with one rivalry and led to the plan to destroy all the Jews. Now, when we get to the end of chapter 3, what we should really be feeling and wrestling with is how upside down the world feels. Everything is backward. Everything is wrong. A madman is in control. A Sweet Jewish girl is brought into the harem of this king and made her queen. And when Mordecai does the right thing, instead of getting rewarded, the entire nation is sentenced to death. And we should be crying out, where is God in all of this? What is he up to? Now, when we go further on in the book of Esther, we're going to see how all the threads tie together. But I think it's important to stop here at chapter 3 and reflect a moment. Because Esther chapter 3 is where we live most of our lives. You see, the book of Esther ends all tied together with a pretty bow. You get to see what God was doing in all these situations. But that's not a perspective that we're given in the middle of our lives. When our life seems upside down, when random, apparently meaningless things happen, we're not told, hey, this is exactly why God's allowing this to happen in your life, and this is how it's all going to end. That's a perspective that we often will not get until our lives are over. So I think Esther chapters 1 to 3 invites us to ask the question, what is God up to when he seems completely absent? When our lives seem completely out of control? And what about when some of that is our fault? Will God be faithful even to a people who are not faithful? And what, how are you supposed to respond to God when you don't understand what's happening in your life? Well, even though we're not promised to be given insight into all the details, one thing we can be confident of is that when God makes a promise, he keeps a promise. So in the New Testament, Paul gives us some insight some perspectives on how to think about what God is up to. In his letter to second, it's a Timothy, his second letter. He says, if we are faithless, he remains faithful, for he cannot disown himself. God's promise keeping is not contingent upon our faithfulness. Even when we are faithless, God remains faithful to his promises. 
in the letter to the Romans, uh, Paul says that we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him and who have been called according to his purpose. Now, this verse has been wielded in some dangerous ways in the history of the church. But while this per- many people use this verse and then they try to step into a difficult situation and say, this is how I think God is working for good in this. Wrong direction. We're not given that perspective. What we're told is when we have no idea, God is still working for good. That when it seems like life is out of control, God has not taken his hand off the wheel. God is working all things together for good. That doesn't mean he's responsible for the pain and the hardship in our life. It means that even in the pain and the hardship, he hasn't given up on us. All this leads to the idea, the theological idea we call providence. Karen Jobes, an excellent scholar on the book of Esther, describes the providence of God this way, that God, in some invisible and inscrutable way, governs all creatures, actions, and circumstances through the normal and the ordinary course of human life without the intervention of the miraculous. That doesn't mean that God doesn't do miracles. It means that even when he's not doing miracles, he's still governing everything that happens. C.S. Lewis said it this way in a letter to one of his friends. He said, let's bring up that C.S. Lewis quote. The great thing, if one can, is to stop regarding all the unpleasant things as interruptions of one's own or one's real life. The truth is, of course, that what one calls interruptions are precisely one's real life. The life God is sending one day by day, what one calls one's real life is a phantom of one's own imagination. So as we enter into this series on a people living in exile, before we get to see all the wonderful way God's, God works, I think we need to pause and acknowledge the things that don't make sense in our lives. My guess is right now there are some threads in your story that seem to have gone in a horrible direction that you can't make sense of. And what I wanna invite us to do is we get ready to sing about the faithfulness of God is to take a moment to acknowledge the things that don't make sense, to acknowledge the things that we don't know where they're going, and also acknowledge that a God who makes promises keeps them, and he is faithful. And as an act of faith, simply take those to the Lord in your mind and tell him, Lord, I don't know what you're doing here, but I trust you to be faithful. Lord, we believe. Help our unbelief even when we don't understand and we cannot see what you're up to, help us to truly believe and trust that you are good. You've never failed us yet and you never will. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.